Finally, by the last session, people realized that when it says recording in progress, there's a recording in progress. So, it's also coming through the speakers now. And we're just going to wait a couple minutes here for people are still coming in. Literally and figuratively. Share my screen. It's already done. Yeah, you're all set. You're already on. Someone there, but I'm not set. Yeah, it's out here. It's all good. Okay. Oh, that's right. None of these are showing me what the audience is seeing. That's what I'm, that's fine. What are those called? Those speakers that <laughs> I need a brain. Someone provides it. Google is my brain. Yeah. No, we said we can we're leading off here, right? I'm leading off. All right. Should we get started? Yeah. All right. Welcome back. Let's get started with the, is the last session before the keynote. Before the keynote. Yeah. Last session before the keynote. Um, Marjorie and I are going to talk about it's, it's it's not so much a presentation as a discussion we're going to have, and so we're going to. But, but I've got a few slides to get us, or we have a few slides to uh, to get it to get us started. Let's build a free and open bar exam. Free and open bar. Oh my gosh, that's a terrible. <laughs> Let's build free and open bar exam materials for the new bar exam. That that makes sense. All right, all right. Use the mouse to advance the slide. There we go. So TLDR, the bar exam is undergoing major change. You all know that, right? Studying for the bar is a significant effort for students and a significant cost as well. And the outcomes, this is this is now opinion, the outcomes are too important to be outsourced. This is a theme you might have heard me say from the opening, you know, to be outsourced to uh, third party profit minded vendors. And so posit the question, what if the academy built its own open educational resource, OER, bar exam, study, library? You know, and our, our thinking is that we want to form a stakeholder group to discuss this idea going forward, because this is not a, uh, uh, my uncle has a barn and we can build it this weekend uh, sort of project, right? So the pros of doing something like this, you know, means schools could tailor the materials to their specific needs. It means it would be free to students, possibly free to students. What about cost of production and maintenance though, right? Um, there would be a freedom here to explore modalities based on incentivizing good lawyering instead of just passing a test, right? Maybe it's more credible and purposeful for a justice system that law schools seek to serve, right? And this is a, this is a unique opportunity, right? The bar exam hasn't gone through this sort of shake up in a long time and may not again. So it's a strike while the iron's hot. Well, at least at least have a conversation about it. Right? Um, and theoretically, Cali has some experience in large scale, long term content, you know, learning content uh, production and sustainability. Now, the obvious cons: it would 
It's going to cost some money to develop software if it doesn't already exist, to hire content people, to uh, this is a crowded market full of commercial players and even a nonprofit player like Access Lex with Helix. Um, and uh, the thing that I always have to consider are the opportunity costs. We're working on this project. That means we're not working on something else. And is this the, is this a, the, the best use of our of of the consortia, the limited consortia attention span that Cali has? Um, this is your slide. It is. All right. So the next gen bar, which is the name bars and dozens of bars and is calling it. Uh, primary innovation is the increased testing and confidence building in what they're calling more than built. And they did an interesting thing that uh, as far as I can determine, nobody else ever has done, which is they took the taxonomy of lawyering skills that comes out of a trade that was doing it really well down here. Um, Philip and Malcolm uh, broke up a lawyering process all these years ago and tested whether two groups of people actually use the skills that we teach in the clinic and law schools. The two groups of people that were turned with were new lawyers for the students for many of them the last couple of years. Um, and supervisors of people. Mm -hmm. And they tried to take a sample from a wide range of different lawyering settings. So, solos, state firms, legal aid, public defenders, whole host of people. And asked questions about are there skills for the new lawyers that you're actually administering that you can use more? And for the supervisors, are there skills that you think you're in order to determine uh, whether they're good at doing so? And there was a whole range of lawyering skills that they identified. Quite a number of them are not on this slide because they represent analytical skills that we think we're already teaching to lawyers about reading cases, reading statutes, um, deciding on precedent and like. But these were among the top vote getters for stuff that the bar up until now has never said they were interested. So identifying subject matter issues in a client matter, uh, including legal, factual, or evidentiary issues. It comes as a startling, I'm a background a clinical teacher, it comes as a startling revelation to our students that because of client walks in and says, I've got a bankruptcy problem. Did you not really have a bankruptcy problem? They may, in fact, have a consumer problem or a um, domestic problem or a, a clients don't come in these packages. They may actually have two problems. It's not only an idea. How are people at realizing that? How do they get information from clients and from other sources? to figure out whether there's a problem. 97% of all respondents of both supervisors and uh, non-supervisors identified this as a skill that a first or second year associate or practitioner needs to have. Uh, and the column on the far uh, corner here, what happens if they do it badly? On a scale of where three is total disaster and one is half, don't care much, 2.8. If the new person can't identify 
what they kill and what they kill. I have some actually all the time and get off on the wrong foot, be in a fire case, and go to hell and hand that. And you know, evaluating strengths and weaknesses is my matter. That's part an analytical skill or the way. Book skill takes a long time. But it's also in major part. What are the how does the facts and the bias affect? Background, like much more nuanced question than simply, you know, will the law support X conclusion or Y conclusion? Is that uh, in fact your investigation? Respond to finding we know from our data that the most common source of complaint to borrow it. My lawyer won't answer my question. My lawyer won't pick up the phone. You know, Cleo says that in their surveys as well. Yeah, Number one. So, identifying goals and objectives. Right. Yeah, I talked to the point to figure out what it is they want, not necessarily what the law will support. But what they want in a particular situation, to persuade others that they could assume that they were in task, or I inform clients about status, that's on an inquiry, flipped another way, interview. Okay. So the bar is now saying they're going to test me. And it's a new idea. What they're saying is that they're going to test a new skill, and what they're now saying is they're going to use They're going to create a scenario and have people uh, respond to them. And the reason they're saying they're going to do it on people is that they think it's cheating. I am probably like to some extent for the legal reason. But the fact is, it's not real. If you want to conduct a point here, do you need to do that? You know, to, to read the transcript of the point of view where somebody did or did not ask you my question, and you have no idea what the client's facial expression was when they answered that question. So, can we develop both from the training vehicle for our students? And also, mindfully to show the bar that we can we develop automated material. You can do this live. Alcohol tried to do it uh, 10 years ago and concluded that A, it was not sufficiently, the grading wasn't sufficiently uniform. Marjorie, we're moving in so that you're also on camera for our uh, remote speakers. I should have noticed that. Okay. Am I now good? All right. So, uh, as I said, California tried to do it live. It cost too much money. Oh, and, a more. Sorry. and it wasn't. <laughs> now you're on. Now you're on. Yeah. And, it, and it wasn't. Um, couldn't withstand the uh, challenge as, as being uh, sufficiently uniform. So you can solve those problems with technology. And so what I'm proposing is that there are some things that we've already, somebody's already built that we could use. The first of these is uh, the sort of the evidence trial simulation goes along, you stop it when there's an evidentiary objection. That was done by originally Harvard and then they went up to Stanford and then they called themselves the uh, BMI. The and, 90s, yeah. that's right. and 
<clears throat> so we know the model and we can we, we can the recreate model, the model. Model. We know it's it's much easy. cheaper these days than what they used to do with laser discs in the 80s. Yeah. And you could do the same thing with interviewing. I saw it done on a Sony demo again in that same time frame where you do a QA with the client on the screen and depending on what kinds of questions you ask, you get useful answers or not so useful answers and using our ancient technology. And to be clear, this is not an AI no. watching the student doing it. This is the student choosing a, a choose your own adventure video, essentially. Um, and then getting evaluated on the on the paths that they choose or getting instant feedback on whether they've chosen the correct paths. So somebody would have to write the scripts, the entire decision tree of the scripts and the and, and then produce the audio or the video that, that would that would talk about that. It's not an underlying model of what you're trying to teach. That's a really trivial kind of application. Yeah, that's just work. Yeah. It's not it's not even it's not new to, we don't have to develop create new technology that doesn't exist. Yeah. Then you could parse out some of the considerations. For example, don't try to conduct an entire negotiation in simulation, but what's a good, given this set of facts, what's a good opening offer? What should you be thinking about? What kind of considerations should you be thinking about in terms of uh, making open an offer? Topics, choice of order of topics for cross examination, structure of direct, lots of little bits and pieces that frankly would fit right now into a tally lesson format. Um, just uh, uh, clearly existing technology. Relatively easy choice, some kind of Again, pre canned simulation kind of stuff um, with an interview with the client. And depending upon the nature of the client's the nature of the question, you branch the client's response. Uh, based on the response, you branch the questions more complicated than the little bits and pieces, but it is within the realm, I think, of the doable. You had some suggestions about... Right, a chat... I came up with Eliza, but you came up with some of them. Right. right, Eliza parrots back what you say to right. it. A chat bot... Right. Right. A chat bot is a, uh, is a, is a, is a, is a pre-programmed uh, decision tree. Conversational AI, though, you know, th think, you know, listen to what the, the student or, or test E says and try to, you know, uh, I, I never want, I don't want to preclude the possibility that you could do something with an existing AI system that was tuned to this, um, but that would require some investigation. And then there are questions about how tricky do you want it? Do you want to do VR? Do you want to uh, try to make this an immersive kind of world of Lawcraft? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that is to a large extent in real life what we're doing in clinics across the country, right? We're having students learn how to conduct an interview by conducting interviews with people and um, giving them some theory about how they're supposed to do that, but then basically letting them loose on some uh, not entirely unsuspecting clients, clients not allergic to the students when they uh, come into the um, Anyway, all of that technology sits out there in, and has a potential for use. And the question is, as John says, this is a once in a lifetime change. Um, bar, if they're going to do this, is either going to fail or succeed. And whichever way it goes, 
the opportunity is not going to come along. So presumably our students would like to pass the bar. Presumably they would also like to be competent lawyers. To the extent that we can leverage our resources to do some piece of this, I I think the game is worth the candle. And I we're hoping that we will take that. That's the idea. So we've used up our, our 15 minutes of fame here, um, but email me at jmayorandkelly.org. I'm going to form up an informal stakeholder group to, you know, to uh, discuss. We'll create a Google group and a website where we collect resources and, um, you know, to, to flesh out these ideas a little bit more. There's a lot of ground to cover, but, you know, if you want to uh, participate and, or join with us, uh, please do. Back, Selmer. I am. Yeah, I'll just delete your. Uh, uh, no, I'll let you put that in. What do we do? Yeah. Let me do this first. Which one is yours? We'll see. To share the screen again? No, we're all good. So, hello to everybody in the Zoom metaverse, the folks here in, in person. Uh, let's just see if I can get this going here. <clears throat> so, I'm here today to uh, talk about the county syllabi comment. Um, and uh, it's been a project now that uh, I started in November of 2019. Chris contacted John, and uh, so it's it's been on my to-do list for what, eight nine years now, and so I, I'm finally here to say I've done it. Uh, John Prado, um, and uh, this is a screenshot. Everything I'm doing is screenshot for a number of reasons, um, but it may help this actually uh, move a little more slowly. Um, and so if, if you just uh, Google Cali Silby Commons, the uh, the URL is on top here, but just Google Cali Silby Commons, and you will get the site that's been built. Um, uh, I want to just say thank you to Cali. Uh, I've been involved with Cali now for a very long time. And, you know, what John has done with uh, his team, uh, Elmer and Jessica and, uh, and Deb and everybody, um, yeah, I think it's just remarkable. And, um, you know, when uh, when I think of Cali, you think of the exercises, you think of A to J author, you think of what you're doing to disrupt uh, legal publishing, with Eli and Dell, and now with this, you know, with other industries that I have about. Um, the cell by commons, you know, doesn't really quite stack up to, you know, a, a major, major initiative, but um, I, I, I thought it was great. When I, when I first saw it in 2019, there were 54 cell by that have been posted that John had put up there. And, um, and I'm really interested in the question of, well, how do you train lawyers to be technologically competent, you know, to have technological literacy? And um, so I'll show you this slide. This is um, from 1993. Um, the, the, the guy on the left is uh, uh, a guy named Willem Schulten. And the other guy would, would, would be me. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't show you this slide to show you how little I've changed over the last 30 years. Uh, but, uh, but to say that um, I learned about technology from the guy on the left. Um, he was really a computer genius. Uh, and, and, and the word genius is kind of overused, but um, he, he really was a computer genius who I got to know. Uh, I, I started working with Jim Hoover in September 1990, and I was interested in large textual databases. That's sort of what motivated me after I'd been practicing law and I wanted to do something else, and this is something else. Uh, and, um, and so I started working with Jim Hoover, who was a law librarian at Columbia, and Willem, who was the first uh, IT director at Columbia, but by the time I had gotten there, he was working with a company called Thinking Machine. And um, this is the computer that we're standing in front of. It's a Thinking Machine CM2. At the time, the CM5 was the fastest supercomputer in the world. Uh, and so this is an older model that we had brought to the sixth floor of the law library 
And uh, I was working with a team of undergraduate students who were furiously scanning in anything we could find pretty much to get permission for. And uh, Willem was going up to uh, Cambridge to uh, work with uh, Danny Hillis and Booster Kale, people like that, up at thinking machines and trying to figure out natural language process. Um, and so um, for four years, I worked alongside um, Will, and um, he was, um, you know, really generous in, you know, answering all these questions that I had because I didn't know that much about computers. Uh, Columbia did pay for me to go to library school where, you know, they, they had changed the curriculum to make it sort of more technical, and so there was some in that. But name it, I mean, that's that's how I learned about, you know, IT. I didn't go to, you know, get a master's degree or PhD or anything. But um, uh, we, were, we were trying to do this thing called the Wide Area Information Server, um, which um, was, we thought, you know, the way that everyone's going to communicate. Um, because what the heck, I mean, we would, we would have in front of every record on every computer that we put up a mark record, right? Because then you could find stuff. And really, you know, in the early days of the World Wide Web, we couldn't find anything because, you know, there was no metadata involved. And so we had we had a great idea. Um, but there was um, a, a few things, a few minor things that, that came along, uh, you know, around 1994 um, that people really started to use. Uh, one was called HTTP. The other was HTML. Uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee had something to do with that. And then, then of course, the browser came along and, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen did something with that. And so, uh, Willem moved to Seattle uh, and uh, became in charge of a project that was the first major initiative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that project was to wire up every public library in the United States. And so Willem became in charge of that. And I was trying to know what hey, I'm going to do uh, now that this is over because obviously the World Wide Web was, you know, the way people are going to create it. <laughs> um, uh, and we'll call it Vaporware, by the way. Um, it's a good tradition. Uh, <laughs> but in any event, so, um, so there I was at Columbia, and I had learned for four years all about information technology. And so I wanted to figure out how we could put this into the curriculum, right? So that's sort of the idea. And that's why it struck me that what John was doing here, trying to figure out, you know, what kind of syllabi people use uh, to teach was interesting. Um, I started working with uh, Conrad Johnson and Mary Zulak. In the late 90s, they had a civil litigation clinic. And so we were trying to figure out, well, how can we use technology to help them litigate? Um, and then by the late 90s, uh, we, we came up with this idea that every lawyering task has an information component. Uh, and that we shouldn't just have information technology at the margins, which is a fairly common thing, but we should try to build it into the center. And so we came up with the Lawyer and Visual Aids Clinic. Um, year 2000, and so for 20 years, uh, we've been teaching uh, students about technology, and uh, much of what I've been doing is trying to find the right kind of resources to, you know, to teach Columbia Law students about information technology. It is not an easy thing to do. I mean, I, I've always uh, been envious of people who teach courses like torts, where you have a casebook. You know, you've got, uh, you know, an outline, a, a series of well-developed concepts. Uh, you know, you have uh, Falls Graph versus the Long Island Railroad, the duty of care. You know, there you are. You've got, you figured it out, right? Not so much. And so people who teach this kind of subject, I think, understand it is not an easy thing to do. Um, and so um, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll do an analysis of uh, the syllabi comments, right? I'll do an analysis. Uh, I will come up with, uh, you know, sort of sets of resources that we can sort of extract, deconstruct what is, is in here. Because this is, I mean, with 75, you know, different links, you're never going to really appreciate what's in there, right? And, and, and get a good idea unless we did this other sort of layer to it. And so that's, that's what I was trying to accomplish. Um, and so, uh, in you know, the end of 2019, I said, well, you know, uh, you know, be your own digital transformation. I would, I would get some software. This is called Scrivener. Uh, and uh, as, as Conrad Johnson always tells Columbia Law students, start digital and stay digital, right? Which is something I've always, you know, strive to, uh, you know, achieve. I aspire to that. And so, so I, I set up these little cards. 
sorry, the scrivener and put in the metadata. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, John and I talked about a taxonomy. All right, I'm going to come up with a taxonomy for what is, you know, in, in these different syllabi. And I was thinking, you know, what, what would we do is we, uh, you know, if you think of a continuum, if you think of a continuum where, uh, you know, everybody who teaches Python over here and people who teach, say, uh, intellectual property over here, and maybe, uh, you know, e-discovery in the middle. And then sort of where do you fit the rest of it, right? I was going to come up with a way to somehow balance the sort of technology component heaviness or lightness, you know, based on that continuum. Um, that didn't work. Um, it, it was a good idea. It didn't work. And also using these little cards and shuffling them around also didn't work. Uh, and so it got me to here, uh, which is I printed out everything, right? It's, it's, it's over 500 pages. And, um, and, and, and what you see here is a, you know, a stack of paper neatly, you know, uh, correlated uh, in my uh, family room. Uh, but really what happened was my, my, my wife went uh, on a trip to Europe for about a month. And, uh, and, and I had all these syllabi just strewn all over the house, right? You know, coding for lawyers was over here and artificial intelligence was over there. And, I, you know, I, and, and so, you know, finally I, I collated it and that's what it looks like. Um, and, um, and so I, uh, I, I wrote an introduction, it's 15 pages, it will be available at some point, but I, I, I came up with one way to break it down, and, and that was to do survey courses and topic-focused courses. I mean, it, it became pretty clear that everything fell into one of these two categories. Either you're trying to teach a survey course, which has a lot of different topics in it, or you're trying to teach something that's much more concentrated. So I, I you know, that was sort of the first cut at it. And um, and then I, I came up with this list um, where lawyer competence and ethics sort of what's the rationale for lawyers to understand information technology, right? The whole question of competence kind of begins begins uh, you know the dialogue, and and then there are lots of other uh, topics you know down to the future of law practice. And that's maybe one way to take a look at this. Um, and uh, uh, the survey courses, uh, as you'll see, you know, focused on these. Uh, in the topic-focused courses, there were there were two categories that weren't in the survey course: uh, problem-solving, decision-making, and then uh, Mark Lawrence and you know uploaded the the syllabus for the Shakespeare course, and I had to put another category for argumentation. So thank thank you, Mark, for that. Um, and, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But um, what I was able to do by strewing all these syllabi around my house was to take the uh, 32 courses that I considered survey courses. Uh, and, and so there's a column here for each of those courses. And if there's a red check mark, it means that the syllabus indicated that that particular topic was being taught. Um, and so, you know, this, this goes over. It's a Google sheet, and we'll, we'll post that in one form or another. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, a lot of the survey courses uh, teach a pretty wide range of topics, right? Which is, which is a really difficult thing to do, I mean, having tried doing it myself. Um, because, uh, you know, you, you, you take a, a, you know, a subject like blockchain, or you take a subject like artificial intelligence, right? Some, I mean, these are very deep topics. And, and to say, okay, we're going to spend a class, because that's the way most of these uh, were sorted out, was, you know, a class uh, on a particular topic. Um, not easy to do. And then um, the other one, uh, the other, oh, yeah. And so as, as, as you scroll through this, you, you mass over it and you can tell, you know, which courses is not just this. Um, and then so for the topic focus courses, there are 34 topic focus courses. And um, uh, so depending, you know, if your course is primarily about project management or you know, lean, you know, you're you're in your own network. Um so that may be useful. I think it's useful first of all with the with the uh, topic focus course or uh, the survey courses to 
just see what the heck it is that people are teaching, right? What is what is you know legal tech, and what and what are people interested in? And so um, you know we get a, a good idea just from that, I think, analysis. And then also now with the top of the focus course is what you know what people are focusing on in, in the more sort of developed course uh, that that people are working on. And um, uh, and so for each each of these topics, uh, I create a series of folders. And within the folders, um, there are two now Google Docs. I was talking to Elmer about maybe we can do this on WordPress or something to make it a little less clunky. But there, uh, there's a syllabi content page, which is to say I deconstructed syllabi, extracted it, and then put it into, into the particular topic. Because you know, different courses teach you know, different topics at different times in the semester, you know, trying to figure out. You know, well, you know, if, if you're interested in electronic discovery, uh, what courses have what materials on that? You know, you have to sift through all of them. We're here about electronic, you know, with this particular type of court technology, uh, you know, it's all kind of collated in, in, in this form. And then a suggested resources is something that I, I was interested in doing, which is to sort of, you know, for my own benefit, update what the heck is out there, right? What, what materials are available to try to teach students, um, you know, these topics. So, um, got a few highlights uh, of, of what people have posted. Uh, so, we'll start with the survey courses. Uh, whoops, let me go back one. Um, so, here's one from uh, uh, Suffolk University from uh, Clinton Steenhouse. I mean, it's an amazing webpage that, that he's built. And he has not only you know, this particular um, course, but he's got other, two or three other courses. You know, on this one page as well that, that he teaches about. And actually go through this, it's just, you know, it's amazing and really well prepared, really well organized. And so, you know, that's that's one way to do it. I mean, I, I think it'd be great if you know, we could all have, you know, a really well focused web page for, for our students in, in the way that Quentin has done. So I, I mentioned that as a, as a uh, survey course. Um, another one um, is from Dennis Kennedy. Now, Dennis is, is uploaded, I think now six syllabi. Um, and uh, the, um, the the course that, that he teaches here with um, entrepreneurial lawyering uh, and some other material that he has was actually uh, originally developed uh, by uh, uh, another person who's an expert in, in lean law and that kind of thing. Dennis has is, is, is worked his way into teaching a whole bunch of Courses now. I think there's four four different topics that he teaches, but it's great stuff. Everything that Dennis has put up, you can see he's got linked out to you know freely available material. And so if you're interested, you know, in in you actually teach this stuff, it, it's well worth your time to see what Dennis has done. Um, you know, the topic focus courses. Um, so I, I'm you know I, I've known Mark Lawrence for a long time, and and, and I can remember discussing with him. Um, this course, which uh, was back a few years ago, which is about decision making, and uh, Mark alluded it, alluded to this uh, in in his talk uh, that he, he uses a software called Choice Boxers to help people figure out how to make decisions. Right, um, fascinating stuff. I don't think I ever understood it. You know, if someone didn't what he told me, I still don't understand how to look at it. But it's you know good stuff. Um, and then of course, you know, you've got Shakespeare too, which I didn't. Focus on. Um, so here's one from uh, Cat Moon at Vanderbilt, which I, I, I'm highlighting this because uh, she has on her website another great website. Uh, uh, books we wish we had time to read, and then, then other books. And this list of books is just phenomenal. Right? It's, it's 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 amazing stuff. Um, you know, he, he, uh, she, she mentions um, uh, Dan Pink, for example. Did, did, didn't he get a an opening. No, I never had pink. I had clay shirky. Oh, no, or shirky. Okay, right. Uh, would you once again? So you know that stuff is, is here, right? Um, and uh, it's and I haven't I haven't read most of it. You know, one of these days maybe I will. But it's I, you know it's it's fantastic list of books. Um, then this course, um, which uh, as an example of, of a syllabus, is, is fabulous. I think. Um, and it's uh, by An An Angela Walsh at St. Mary's University. Um, and uh, it is just an outrageously good 
course on blockchain. If you're interested in blockchain and cryptocurrencies, that kind of thing, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, uh, the page that I have here is about smart contracts, smart legal contracts. And that's just you know, one topic of, of many other topics. You know, she goes into you know, our uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, securities, the holy rule about taxation, you know, the entire you know, range of, of issues with respect to crypt you know, cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. I mean, if you took this course, you would be you know, an authority in this. I mean, you know much more than uh, you know, anyone else. Uh, probably, um, and, uh, and and she's written her own textbook about it. Really fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, syllabus. And then um, another thing that, that she does after each class is to include these reflection questions, which are just brilliant. I mean, I've, I've been I've been talking to Conrad about this idea for a long time, and you know, it, I think I think it's a great idea to figure out um, you know as you put your materials up for your syllabus. You know what reflection questions you, you want your students to do. It does a great job. Um, here's another one um, coding the law, once again at Suffolk. Um, and uh, it goes through uh, seven uh, levels. Uh, it's, 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 it's really well designed in the sense that it goes from step one, learn these things, step two, learn these, now up, up, up to level seven. Fabulous, just great stuff. Uh, go ahead. Point that out, um, and then um, you know, those those syllabi that I'm highlighting here are you know, really a small subset of some of the other really great material that's been posted. I don't mean to sort of exclude other other courses and you know, people who have gone to the trouble to send you know, John the syllabi, but um, you know it's true that so much of the material that is linked that is publicly available is not all that substantive, right? I mean, you get a four-page article uh, from, you know, an American Bar Association publication or you know, maybe a book from the American Bar Association. I uh, like Mark's um, uh, book about um, working with knowledge machines and stuff like that. I mean, you know, th th that, it, that does exist, but not very many people are assigning the ABA publications as, you know, the primary material in, in, uh, in their courses. Um, and so one of the things I, I, I try to point out in my introduction and um, that I think is important for people to know if you don't know about this, how many people know about this book? Few, yeah, not too many. Um, I was contacted by Cambridge University Press several years ago. I meant to look up when that email was. And, um, and, I, and I had to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement uh, with them. Uh, so I really can't talk about it, but I can say uh, that I, I was aware of this book. Uh, and, and that Cambridge was going to publish it. It only took like four years to publish it. Um, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really good book. Um, and just to, to highlight a few, a few of the chapters, I, I have a, a PDF of the table of contents that I put with the introduction so you can see all the chapters, the 34 chapters. Um, but uh, it's, you know, really, really good information, right? The people who have written this material are some of the you know best thinkers in, in these areas. I don't think there's any, you know, any, any question about that. Uh, and, uh, and so I want to mention that you know now finally as in 2021, it was like a slash fall or something, it came out. Um, it was published. Um, but you know it's 125 bucks. Uh, and uh, you know I don't know if you if you teach a survey course whether you're going to want to adopt this as your textbook. And, and I'd be interested in but you know, knowing as, as people go through this, whether or not they think this is a solution to sort of the problem we have for people who teach technology to law students, you know, try to develop a curriculum, whether legal informatics will actually, you know, be the solution to the problem. So there you go. That's that's really all I had to say. Oh, except that uh, there is a resources for current awareness that, that I've had for a long time that I also link that can help people. Um, stay up to date with Great. Thank you. Up next, we've got uh, one more video.
We'll say that this video is 18 minutes long. <laughs> Sarah should have edited more. Okay, so let's get this screen share. I love all of the Cali lessons. But of course, if I only have to pick a couple, I can I can come up with two that I that I really like. The first one that I assigned to all of my 1L students is a lesson called Outlining Basics. Outlining Basics is really good because I think many of our students struggle with not just this concept of an outline, they struggle with how do I do it? What are the steps of going through outlining? What do I need to do? when someone tells me to outline a course and how does that really relate to final exams i think that there are multiple cali lessons on outlining that are really good and i would start with that outlining basics the second cali lesson that i really like is one that i wrote on inserting cases into final exams i think one struggle our students have is not understanding how class by class talks about cases but how that really relates to finals. And I know that we teach them, here's how you synthesize and here's how you create doctrine, but many of our students don't then realize, well, how can I use those cases on a final exam if the final really isn't about the case? And I try to, in that Cali lesson, specifically say, here's where you insert the case, here's how you use it here's how you can use it to define what the rule is here's how you can use it as an analogy how we can make arguments of similarities and differences on the analogies and really work through how those cases fit on final exams to really improve exam writing and fundamentally improve legal analysis so if i was to pick a couple i really like helping students outline because I think that's a skill they really need and then when they get to final exams trying to insert those cases into final exams to help them score more points. I have a couple of favorites. My first favorite is thinking like a lawyer. Thinking like a lawyer mainly because it was my first one. It was my first Kelly lesson that I did and it really challenged me in the sense of having to think about how I teach and what feedback I give to students. So I'm used to doing many of the lessons that I incorporated in, into this Kelly lesson in a classroom and basing my feedback or next steps on the response of my students and how the class is going. So I had to really sit down and think about how do I do this without the immediate feedback of students and how do I give them feedback in a worthwhile way when they're not in the classroom. More importantly, I think that no one really talks about what it means to think like a lawyer. You hear it all the time that you're going to learn to think like a lawyer, but I don't know that anyone ever defines it. So I really wanted to create something that helps students define what it means to think like a lawyer, but also how do you do that? Like what, where do you even start? What does that mean? And how do you work on that skill? Another favorite lesson of mine that is recent is law school lingo. I created it mainly for first generation students, but it can really be useful to anyone. And the reason it's one of my favorite is simply for a selfish reason. I wish I would have had it entering law school. It's not necessarily a very deep lesson in the sense of it being overly difficult, but I think it's incredibly useful for those students who are just nervous about the language being used. I also love Nicole's course selection, Kelly lesson. Again, it's something that we don't frequently talk about. We don't really teach students how to make course selections or how to schedule themselves. And if there are no lawyers in your life or you don't have a mentor in the legal field, it can be really difficult 
to figure this out all on your own. And plenty of schools have an academic advisor, um, but I just found that this lesson is so helpful for a student to be able to really walk through it on their own in a thoughtful way while having guidance and sort of not feeling rushed in a meeting. I know it sounds like I'm really just punting here, but I have lots of favorite lessons and it really depends on the time um, in the course and what's going on. I think for the lessons I created, my favorite one is probably the one I did on metacognition. Um, it was a labor of love and it was the first lesson I did. So maybe that explains why, but I have different favorites at different times. I really try to use as many as I can and, and really like many of them. I think one of my favorite Cali lessons is the lesson on how to use cases on final exams. Um, it's a topic that in working with the 1Ls, I always find is a little bit tricky to teach and practice. Uh, and so this lesson gives students the chance to look at a sample exam answer and then use active learning strategies to select different portions of the answer that illustrate various components um, of the paradigm of legal analysis. The rule, the rule illustration, arguments in the analysis section uh, that make analogies to or make distinctions from cases. The format, I think it works really well, especially for students who are first starting out, 1L students, first semester students who are learning the basics of how to construct a, an exam answer and where cases fit in. The other lesson that really stands out to me is a time management lesson, because I think that the author did a really great job of making, making concrete something that is a very difficult and very individualized topic to talk to students about. Um, it absolutely is so critical to introduce students to the concept of time management really early on and, and, and really like set the foundation for how crucial time management is um, to their success. The lesson walks them through steps, creating a plan, how to create your plan, um, helps them build a weekly plan and a semester long plan. It also sort of normalizes obstacles that sometimes I think when we talk to students about time management, you know, everybody wants to be very um, ambitious and, and aspirational and pretend or, or at least imagine a world where there is no, life doesn't happen, right? Life doesn't intervene, but the lesson really um, helps to helps to recognize, normalize these these sorts of obstacles like caretaking for for family members, um, unavoidable travel, things like that, and and it it prompts the student to reach out to uh, their their law school you know student affairs staff, academic success staff, um, whoever else might be might be on on campus to help them with that. We've done a number of really good podcasts. There are two that really stand out for me. And one is especially relevant during this time, and that is surviving the pandemic. Unfortunately, there have been so many different effects of the pandemic, and there have been so many different implications for different students that many of them, even if they weren't in law school during the pandemic, don't really know how to handle going forward. So we did a really good podcast. They really discuss all the different aspects of how the pandemic could have affected the studies and, you know, what we can do to help overcome and how we can try to still achieve what we need to in law school, still learn all of the things and be prepared for the bar exam while also trying to make it through kind of what is a really tough time. The second podcast that I really like is a podcast that I did about different final exam formats. Now, unfortunately, students don't know during that first semester what the final exams are going to look like. So I spent a few minutes trying to discuss what the different question types are and how you would approach those questions with a few tips for multiple choice questions, short essay questions, and then some of those longer issue spotting fact patterns. And I think both of those podcasts are nice short things that students can listen to that provide a lot of information in a short amount of time that can help them prepare better both to handle kind of law school in this situation and that kind of different set of final exams. One of my favorite podcasts is the what to expect in law school podcast mostly because kind of like with the vocabulary lesson 
it's something I wish I would have had before entering law school. The law school can be very daunting and no one really knows what to expect. I think even if you have had lawyers in your family, you don't know what to expect. So that's why it's one of my favorites. Another favorite is Laura's class participation because it's so important for students to participate, but it's also nerve wracking for them. So Laura has some great tips and she's just generally great at building confidence and having a very soothing voice. So I really love that one. Sure. Um, I really like the podcast about what to expect in law school. Uh, it's great for students that are just sort of entering into this new realm of learning um, and introduces them to the concept of law school and sort of talks about how law school is different from any academic endeavor that they've done uh, before. The podcast also makes sort of clear, I think, to students that everyone, even their professors, had to make some really extreme adjustments to their expectations of you know of what law school was going to be and how to how to function and be really successful in in law school i assigned cali lessons throughout the entirety of the first year my class might be a little unique in that i get all the one l's for the entirety of the first year we meet about half of the first semester and then half of the second semester. And throughout the entirety of that process, I reinforce my teaching with Cali lessons. So for each of the topics that I do, I have corresponding Cali lessons that I assign them. So I'm doing it from when they start law school in that very first semester all the way through kind of the end of the first year. This year, I'm also going to, during the summer, not require Cali lessons, but send them some suggested Cali lessons as a pre-matriculation exercise. Our students, we might be able to catch them at a time in which they're excited to start the process. And there's a couple of Cali lessons that can really help them with transitioning into law school. And I think that one of the good ones helps with vocabulary and some of those concepts that students are really gonna need to know. So right now, I do it through the entirety of the first year. I hope to integrate a little bit more uh, voluntary lessons kind of during that summer, during pre-matriculation. I assign a large number of Cali lessons before and during orientation. Some are mandatory, some are suggested. And I encourage students to do them before they even get to orientation. I also use them as part of a spring course that is taught for those with a lower GPA. It's a required course for them, and I incorporate them into the class syllabus. I haven't used them in orientation yet. It's a good idea to think about going forward. Right now, the place that I've used them um, where I actually assign them is uh, we have a second semester 1L class for our students who are ranked in the bottom third of the class after the first semester grades come out. And uh, I assign several lessons during uh, the course of the semester. I tend to front load, but I actually do think um, it's a good idea and something that I wanna maybe try out uh, when I use them next time and assign them to have students either take the lessons or redo the lessons as we get close to midterms and finals. So we typically assign the Cali Law School Success um, lesson series to the evening students starting in our Summer Law Institute program, which is like the end of July. Um, that convenes before orientation starts. We put them on our um, course, our course webpage for the Summer Law Institute, and suggest that students, you know, do them. We don't; it's not mandatory, but it's definitely strongly suggested. Um, and then we also list those lessons in our welcome letter in our orientation evening program welcome letter, um, which gives the students sort of a chance to do those lessons before orientation even starts. I use the Cali lessons to reinforce what I'm teaching. In my first year class, I'll teach on a topic like rule synthesis. And then as homework after that class, they have to then complete the rule synthesis Cali lesson. And so during my class, I've really taken the topics that I go through and I have found at least one, if not multiple Cali lessons at which I want them to complete, to reinforce what we're teaching in the class. I also do a few of the Cali lessons and insert those in there 
that maybe I don't talk about in class because I don't have time, but I think it's something that they really need. And a couple of those lessons are the metacognition lesson. I think it's really good to help students with understanding what it is they need to know about learning and how to learn. And then one of the other lessons I, I assigned is the secrets to memorization lesson. It's tips on how to memorize. And I don't really talk about those in class as much, but I think that those are helpful for students as they're going through their first year. For the orientation lessons, they're not really incorporated into anything. They're assigned more as pre-work before students get to campus. For the spring course that is required for certain students with a lower GPA, I use them as homework. And then during class, we talk about the results or we expand on a certain topic. Or sometimes I just use them to make sure that a student has prepped a certain topic um, and I sort of know that they have a baseline knowledge on something. What I've done so far is I will typically list some specific lessons in the syllabus. Um, and these tend to be front loaded. I tend to assign them during the first you know, few weeks of, of the course. And then what I found is then I add lessons. I'll sometimes have in the syllabus where I'll say Cali lesson, TBA. Sometimes I won't even say that and I'll just add them. So I will often have specific lessons assigned in the syllabus at the beginning of the course and then add and adjust uh, as needed going forward. Um, I mean, the good thing about this course is since it's meant to help students uh, develop skills to succeed in law school, a lot of it has to do with who the students are in my class and how they're, how they're doing. So I give myself a lot of room to change um, the sort of the direction of the class in certain ways when I see how students um, do on different assignments and those Cali lessons are included. So if I find that students are struggling in a particular area, I may change um, the syllabus and I may, you know, sort of redirect accordingly. I think it's intimidating to give assignments where there's somebody else speaking. And I think, you know, being the control freak that I am, I actually probably struggled a little bit with this at the beginning and really got pushed to do it because I was part of the fellowship and felt I needed to. And now that I do, I think it's a great thing. So I would say, you know, obviously you want to carefully check all the lessons before you assign them, but don't be afraid to give these um, and create a little bit of a flipped classroom in places where necessary. I think it's a great way for students to do some of these kind of, you know, assignments on their own. Um, and then it gives, you know, great opportunity to, to discuss, you know, sort of big picture information that you get from the results. Sure. So in terms of how best to use these Cali Law School success lessons, I think what really would be a good first step would be to think about what skills you want your students to, to have. Remember, they can run these lessons multiple times and sometimes they'll want to. Um, and you can recommend that they run them multiple times during the semester at different, at different points. You know, using these lessons to support what you're teaching them, what, the, what they're getting in their doctrinal and legal writing classes as, as a really like a support of the critical law school skills that you want them to have. And so, going through the different lessons and sort of looking at the list of, of possibilities, you know, selecting maybe 10 lessons or so, um, making those kind of the priority and then figuring out where in your syllabus um, or where in the year that you want to assign them. And that's really specifically directed towards um, first year students. But that's not to say that these lessons obviously are only for first year students. There's plenty of content that can help second year, third year, even fourth year. Um, you know, evening part-time students in terms of legal analysis, in terms of other things. So I think it's, it really depends on what you, what skills you want your students to, to come out of either the first year or any other year um, really mastering and, and then sort of, you know, interspersing the lessons in your, in your syllabus and in your, in your teaching um, plan, you know, accordingly. Um, 
Margarita or Silver? Silver. Silver. I think it was in contrast because uh, Stephen was was further back, and then you were forward. <laughs> so I should put the so few back so we can make sure the camera is doing Yes, everybody, everybody gets in. So when you're all right. <laughs> Actually, if you guys come over, I can uh, whiteboard a little yeah, bit. Just sort of light up. Yeah, on the thing right here. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I, had, I had a question for uh, the academic support group. What's your inspiration for writing any lesson? Are you thinking about a student who worked, uh, you worked with that has a specific issue? I'm um, thinking of your general experience working in academic support. My inspiration is always what I need in my classroom, what I need for my students, um, what I can use to make my life easier so I don't have to redo the same lesson every semester. And then I try to convince them to write the lessons I can't. Um. <laughs> and that's one of the superpowers of a fellowship is, is you may have a great idea, but you've got already a full plate of lessons to write, maybe somebody else will pick up on it. Yep. Um, and that's the online group? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one thing is that, uh, I mean, we're all friends outside of being fellows together and we work really well together and we've been doing this a while. So we really have had some amazing meetings where we kind of bat around ideas and strategies and we work together a lot. Um, but, but to echo what Melissa said, I mean, honestly, sometimes it's just sort of whatever is, um, is, is sort of the hot button issue that, um, I was like, oh God, I wish there were a lesson for that. For example, I just finished a lesson. It's just the first draft, but instructing students on how to approach professors. If you have a question, how to try to seek out guidance and answer the question yourself, and then how to email the professor, when to email the professor, sort of, you know, sort of appropriate, um, uh, sort of polite emails to send and things like that. And then how to craft questions for the professor so that you don't go and say, you know, explain property to me. I don't understand, you know, negligence. And obviously that's coming from a place where I just have been inundated <laughs> with questions from students where they go about it wrong. They email me at two o'clock in the morning. They demand to meet, they have, you know, typos in their emails. So it's, you know, sort of coming from real world experience that's particularly relevant right now, you know, as the semester was ending. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Melissa and Nicole. I was thinking along the lines of, I have a limited amount of time, like my class is this amount of time, what do I not get to? And so what can I kind of supplement as homework? What can I add in that they're gonna need that, you know, that I'm just not going to have enough time to fully explain. And I think that that's where, and, and Nicole's 100% right, like we did a really good job, I think, in the fellowship within those first couple meetings on the board, and we brainstormed all the different things the students would need, and kind of the collective, you know, experience of all of us. And then we started picking what, what we thought was going to be most beneficial. And that's how I've done it. I, and I think that that's kind of based on experience and kind of what I need for my class. I agree completely with everything um, that everyone else has said. And, and you know, one of my inspirations, I guess, is is you all, right? Like our, our my colleagues, like what kinds of ideas come up in the meetings, like what we talk about, um, you know, as struggles with with you know providing academic support and those kinds of things. And an additional sort of place I think that that um, I find some inspiration is working with the evening students and thinking about kind of along the lines of what Stephen said like what don't I have time to do in class like what don't what might they you know access asynchronously like in kind of flipped uh, you know flip classroom mode to help enhance um, their understanding of what we're going over in the actual class I have a question sort of for Brian but but more more open I mean, all, all, all we've done is in that, in, in your analysis, it was a website where we collected only syllabi from people teaching some sort of tech course to law students. You know, and I always thought, gee, it'd be nice if I had a database of all the syllabi from all the courses and could apply some sort of data mining techniques or something like that. I've been disabused of the idea a few times by people who 
who said that there have been attempts by deans to merely collect the syllabi from their own faculty that have failed. Much less trying to get the syllabi from the, the population of law students. Yeah, the, the ABA actually requires you to submit to your administration the syllabi that you use as part of the regular review process. But extracting them from the deans would not be terribly easy, I don't think. I, th I think one, one of the problems we're, we're faced with is intellectual property. The extent that people may not be, um, you know, the syllabi is copyrighted. Is, is what you're saying? No, uh, well, just yeah. Well, not that the syllabi per se, but you know, sort of what's what's behind it may be. And and the syllabi itself isn't quite as useful as the stuff behind it. And that's one of I think one of the challenges we had with the project was that there were only about a dozen courses that really had links out, you know, to to primary sources that are freely available. Yeah. What are you going to do about the rest of it? Right. You have to send your wife away for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Um, anybody else in the room? Any questions? This is sort of a self interest question from Arjun and John. <laughs> you do a slide with the, the whole feedback about the, um, uh, the practical questions that. The things that seem like they really need on the bar exam. Right. Um, I just, the only question I would have would be MVT question mark. Uh, the MVT currently really only attempts to study legal analysis kind of stuff. Is legal analysis in context? I mean, that was the major uh, step forward with the um, with that exam. But it, it doesn't attempt, for example, to study in client interaction. It it's does, not, it's not in, I mean, would, would, how, how different is what you're, is what yeah. you're I mean, that's something I'm just yeah. sort of wondering about. I, I mean, I can speak with some assurance on that because I was part of the advisory group on, on the original. Um, they were worried about the same issue they're now worried about. Which is uh, whether they can come up with a sufficiently cheap technology, bulletproof technology uh, that will um, enable them to do the examination one. At scale. And that's why they went to this closed universe of cases uh, and statutes and other materials. Uh, because they could achieve that in paper. Okay. I'm sorry, MPT stands for multi state performance test. Right. right. Okay, so I guess, I guess I'm just going. So they've been reluctant, <laughs> they've been being dragged very reluctantly okay. toward uh, something that would more realistically reflect what lawyers actually do with the that, right? It's two essay questions in a, in a three hour session. I mean, could, could, what is, this is, I guess I just, I'm still, I'm sorry, a little obtuse, but, um, but what is, what is it that a new format allows that's different substantively as far as what could be accomplished within the, within the format they have now? Like what, why does it require a change of format? Like what is what is being added? It's not a format, at least as they're envisaging it. It's not a format change. They're effectively going to try to use the same format. Oh. What they're doing is they're adding material and competencies that they don't purport to test on now. And that's why that list is so important, because there's nothing in the uh, MVT right now that attempts to assess whether somebody is competent at interviewing a client. But what I'm suggesting is that the way they're envisaging doing it, they're not going to get where they need to be. And the potential for the use of technology to go beyond what they're currently envisaging. I think it's the interesting piece of it. Well, it sounds like you and I need to have an offline conversation. 
Okay. Yes. Why did they do that? What they're saying on the website now is that they're going to do this in paper. That's what they're saying. I don't think they're going to get there. And what I'm concerned with is unless people pay some attention to the technology, we're going to end up with a half-baked, uh, unsatisfactory model that they are then going to conclude won't work. And as a result, we're going to leave out this entire thing. Those issues are so fundamental to how a good lawyer does his or her job. And we largely omit them from law schools. We teach a few courses and then a couple of clinics. Uh, and as a profession, CLEs almost never go anywhere near them. My hidden agenda, I'm so hidden that I broadcast it to the world. My hidden agenda is that we use this as a way to actually start thinking about how we're going to teach that stuff in something other than this bespoke paper manner, which we now. I think that, but sorry, uh, I'm on our question. Mm -hmm. um, but there are bar studies person that is talking to the MPP, the, the multimedia, so there may be some different information floating around. Well, and, and if they intend to do that, I think that's all the more reason why we ought to try to get out of here. Uh, but um, I was disappointed because when I first heard this, I said, ah, this is perfect. Uh, and then I actually went into their website and started doing some snarking around. And, uh, but it, I mean, that was a relatively early part of their analysis. Maybe they've rethought it. But in any event, it doesn't change the impetus for us to try to do it right. All right. So we've got one more break. And I think we've got what, uh, the, uh, the, the 40th anniversary cupcakes. Um, all right, all right. Are out there. Are out and then there. we'll be back at two o'clock central for the folks listening at home um, for the uh, closing keynote the and closing the, uh, giveaways. Thank you.